Good evening and welcome to the Citizen Advocacy Center virtual forum on direct democracy. My name is Ben Silver and I'm a community lawyer with CAC. Tonight's discussion is being recorded for those of you who cannot make it tonight and for uh, your future enjoyment. CAC is a nonpartisan, nonprofit community legal organization and tonight's presentation is for educational purposes only. It is not meant to convey legal advice and ours and your participation does not create an attorney client relationship. This program is not intended to, nor do we ever support, oppose, or otherwise promote any candidates or parties for public office. Our uh, participants this evening have a substantial amount of experience helping candidates and parties of all stripes reach the ballot. We do support broad ballot access and the voter choice supported by that access, which brings us to tonight's topic, direct democracy, the process by which ordinary people can collect petitions for an initiative to bring a referendum to the ballot. Advocates have sought to expand the initiative process in Illinois since the early days after passage of our 1970 uh, state constitution, and those efforts continue today. In the new General Assembly session, there are at least three separate proposed resolutions involving changes to the state constitution to allow various legislative or recall efforts by citizen petition. In recent years, these efforts uh, unfortunately have not had much popular support in the General Assembly. Yet it seems like every week that our organization fields a call from community activists and organizers looking to change their towns and seeking to place a binding referendum on the ballot. We usually have the unfortunate job of telling them that they cannot do that under our current laws. While the Illinois Constitution does allow for broad advisory questions of public policy and uh, calls for citizen initiative binding ref, ref uh, citizen initiated binding referendums and limited opportunities, uh, those are only where authorized by the Constitution or state statute. Courts have read those provisions very narrowly. Individual binding referendums are scattered throughout Illinois law. In statutes regarding municipalities, townships, schools, taxation, gambling, research by CAC interns has turned up a few hundred of these opportunities. They defy organization and many are long since outdated and pretty useless to most residents. That brings us to tonight. We hope to add fuel to the discussion of direct democracy. We want you to learn about the hurdles to direct democracy in Illinois and how we can join other state and local governments in allowing our residents a stronger voice in the democratic process. We will have plenty of time for questions and answers following the moderated panel discussion. Uh, I, we ask that you please use the Zoom Q&A feature for those questions if you can. If you're having any issues with that, you should be able to get them in chat and we'll field them there as well. And now I am pleased to introduce our uh, panel. Jackson Peller is a community organizer and second year law student at Loyola University of Chicago. He's worked with Reclaim Chicago, Reclaim Evanston and the People's Lobby. He served as a plaintiff in a lawsuit last year that attempted to require Illinois to allow online signature gathering and otherwise lower onerous requirements for referendum petitions. Jackson served as a CAC intern last summer and his summer long research project fueled our recent publications and this forum on direct democracy. Oliver Hall founded the Center for Competitive Democracy in 2005, where he serves as executive director and general counsel. Through litigation, advocacy, and publication, Oliver has helped expand access to the ballot and overcome obstacles designed to block election competition throughout the country. Last year, he won a federal lawsuit ordering the state of Illinois to lower the requirements and extend the deadlines for third party and independent candidates to collect signatures to reach the ballot during the COVID-19 pandemic. Pat Quinn served as the 41st governor of Illinois, first elected to the County Board of Appeals in 1982. He later served as Lieutenant Governor and Treasurer of Illinois. His extensive experience with direct democracy in Illinois includes some of the earliest efforts to amend our state constitution. He led the drive for the only successful citizen initiative, citizen initiated constitutional referendum, the cutback amendment, which eliminated multi-member districts for the Illinois House. He also led the Illinois initiative amendment effort, which received enough signatures to make the ballot, but was ultimately struck down by the state Supreme Court. And Governor Quinn joins us uh, via phone, which you can see on your screen there. Our moderator tonight is CAC's executive director, Miriam Judar. For more than a decade, she has helped build participation, transparency, and accountability into our state and local government as a community lawyer. That includes helping numerous groups reach the ballot with both binding and advisory referendums. Thank you all for joining us, and I'm going to hand it over to Miriam. Thank you. Oh, you're still muted.
Okay, that one doesn't get old, does it? <laughs> thanks, Ben, um, and thanks everyone for being with us tonight. Um, we have a lot to talk about, so I think we'll just dive in. Um, and the first question I want to ask um, is for all three of you, and I thought we could start with Oliver and then move to um, uh, Governor and then to Jackson. And the first question I wanted to ask you was um, to, elaborate a little bit about your background and your unique history with working in ballot access and direct democracy and um, what motivates you to seek solutions to the barriers to direct democracy. Sure, thank you for the question. Thank you for the opportunity to um, speak on these important topics tonight. Um, I started the Center for Competitive Democracy in 2005, fresh out of law school and um, you know, it was really, uh, by the end of law school, it was, it was the only issue I wanted to, to, to work on. And I was very lucky um, to have people help me start a, an original organization and get enough funding to be able to get it off the ground and um, build it into what is um, a viable organization and hopefully will remain one for uh, uh, many years. Um, I, I was motivated to work on the issue of electoral competition um, really when I uh, discovered that ballot access laws, which are enacted, of course, by state legislatures, which are dominated almost entirely, if not entirely in most cases, um, by Republicans and Democrats. And of course, they have an incentive to regulate the ballot more strictly than necessary to protect, protect any legitimate state interest. And then they also uh, uh, um, establish these challenge procedures whereby any citizen can bring a lawsuit to try to throw a candidate off the ballot. And the more I started um, researching that issue and the way these laws often work, it's just a way to um, narrow voter choice and force um, for citizens to choose from the two oldest political parties, the Republicans and Democrats, and exclude everybody else. Um, there are legitimate reasons for the state to regulate access to the ballot, but I think um, in most cases, it's fair to say that the, the regulations are far more restrictive than necessary um, to, to protect state interests. And, um, Everybody may know this already, but I just thought I'd throw in my one Illinois, uh, well, I have more, but uh, a good Illinois ballot access anecdote, which is maybe every, everybody knows this in Illinois, but you know, Barack Obama got elected to office for the first time by throwing all his competitors off the primary election ballot and running unopposed. And that shows how bad the situation can get. And Illinois is somewhat notorious for that sort of scenario, but it, it's not the only bad state. And so that's the kind of thing that can happen even when we're dealing with someone who is um, acknowledged to be a relatively progressive um, politician, but that's how these laws can be used. So I think they're being abused. I think it's a really important issue for um, the health of our democracy. And I'm again, happy to be working on it 15 years later still. Terrific, thank you, Oliver. Um, Governor Quinn, uh, if you would unmute yourself and answer the same question um, to elaborate a little bit about your background in working with direct democracy and ballot access issues and um, you know, what motivates you to seek solutions. Um, you're, you're muted, Governor Quinn. So, um, let's see, I just hit the ask to unmute button. So let's hope that okay. works. Oh, there, there we go. Okay, you're now, you're now good. Governor Quinn. Are you there? Okay, why don't we move to Jackson um, next. Hope you we're able to uh, get him back. So I know. <laughs> a, a lot of my, my, my story on this issue is going to be things that I worked on with Governor Quinn. Right. So hope not to 
um, steal his thunder all that much. But um, yeah, in my story with Battle of Access work starts a lot more recently than both the Olivers and Governor Quinn's. Um, I believe it was near the end of 2019, going into the what the uh, 2020 election would be. A bunch of people I had met through previous uh, pl- previous community organizing activities in Evanston were getting together to try to put the Evanston voter initiative on the ballot, which would have been, in in my mind, the very textbook example of how great a initiative, a a local government initiative under Article 7 of the Constitution could be. It would have given Evanston residents the ability to go around to each other, come up with an idea for a specific local ordinance that they would want the city council to adopt, and then taking that idea to the city clerk turning it into a uh, into a ballot, ballot referendum language, at which point they would have gone around to collect signatures at the same level, I believe, as the law currently requires for local non-binding referendums. And then after turning in those signatures, what the Evanston Voter Initiative would have done is put that ordinance directly on the agenda of an upcoming city council meeting. And they the city council would have had a short period of time to vote yes or no on it. And if they voted yes, it would become law, presuming it was signed by the mayor. But if they voted no, then that idea would then go to the ballot at the next election, where citizens would have the ability to adopt it uh, anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, I made an effort to be as involved as I could with the collection process. But as I, when I was just getting into my first year of law school, I heard that there were objections filed against this, the Evanston Voter Initiative on grounds of it being against the Illinois Constitution and that we were going to have to go to the electoral board. And because this was very much a Governor Quinn idea, he worked, had worked with Evanston residents to really put the whole thing together. Mm-hmm. He was sticking with us through the objection process. And as a first year law student, I jumped at the opportunity to help with the legal work on something that mattered to me. And as, a follow up, as a follow-up question, are there any other municipalities in Illinois that have a municipal initiative system? To my knowledge, there is one, and that is um, Arlington Heights. And shortly after the 1970 Constitution was uh, adopted, created essentially the same mechanism I just described. Although the Arlington municipal government did that, them- Arlington Heights municipal government did that themselves. Okay. And, uh, uh, Governor Quinn, are you there? Uh, we're having technical he problems. Is still unmuted. Well, let me, um, I will mute myself and I will um, see if I can help sort out these technical issues uh, while we okay. move to the next question. Okay. So we'll come back to him. Um, so uh, I know you've touched a little bit on this in your introdu- in your elaboration of um, your interest in this topic, but let's get a little bit more into the nitty gritty with the cases that you all were involved in this past year and um, you know involving ballot access. And um, you know, as, as COVID did, it um, helped to aggravate barriers and inequities that already existed. So um, I know that a couple of these lawsuits were brought forward during COVID because of those unique barriers um, that a pandemic induces. So can we start with you, Oliver, to share um, that lawsuit from last year? Sure, as it turns out, that um, was by far the the best case that we uh, brought in the COVID, I guess the COVID era of ballot access that we were working in last year, um, we filed three three candidate and political party ballot access cases, one in Illinois, one in Maryland, and one in Pennsylvania, and then one initiative case in Ohio. Um, the candidate cases were kind of all over the place um, in terms of outcomes, and it's hard to explain why since they are all essentially arising from uh, the same set of facts involving the pandemic. Of course, each state has its own different laws, but um, the operative f- 
fact there was that we were dealing with a pandemic. In most cases, it was illegal uh, and certainly uh, unsafe to go out and collect signatures. And so we were looking for some kind of relief from the requirement that each of these states imposed that you've got to get uh, signatures um, in person by hand, you know, what they call a wet signature in ink on a piece of paper or petition. Uh, in Illinois, as I said, it turned out to be by far the best outcome that we got. Um, we filed the case in April of last year, I think, and um, Chief Judge Paul Meyer of the Northern District of Illinois Federal Court um, reduced the statutory signature requirement by 90%, uh, extended the filing deadline, allowed us to use electronic procedures, uh, electronic petitioning procedures, um, if we could implement them, and uh, enjoined enforcement of the notarization requirement. So it really was a, a pretty great result. Even with all that relief, I know that the parties that we were representing still struggled to comply. Um, the Green Party and the Libertarian Party did comply, but uh, there were in independent candidates who were unable to do so. Um, just to give you an idea of the range of, of outcomes that we got, in, in Maryland, we filed um, a, a case, again, just seeking relief from the petitioning requirements. In, in that case, um, sort of what I consider a middle ground outcome, we did get some relief. The court reduced the signature requirement by 50% as opposed to 90% in Illinois. Um, I don't think they gave us relief from the filing deadline, but um, the State Board of Elections also agreed to allow electronic petitioning. And then um, as an example of, well, what, what can only be described as a terrible outcome, we filed a virtually identical lawsuit in Pennsylvania and, um, you know, again, seeking relief from the in-person petitioning requirements, uh, the case was dismissed, no relief whatsoever. And the Third Circuit on appeal um, affirmed without giving the case too much thought or analysis. And it's hard to explain how or why the outcomes were so different in these cases, except that in Pennsylvania, um, that was actually the first case that my organization won um, several years ago. We, we uh, had that law, uh, the signature requirements in Pennsylvania declared unconstitutional, and they were substantially lowered by court order. And that court order lowering the signature requirement is still in effect. And I, I kind of think that the courts just took the attitude that they've helped us enough and uh, with the pandemic or not, um, we, we've gotten enough relief. So. Um, so, so the case was dismissed and, and no relief there, but um, um, I mentioned that we also filed a case in Ohio uh, based on the, uh, the initiative requirement there, and um, we were representing proponents of decriminalizing cannabis, um, and they again were essentially prohibited from placing their initiatives on the ballot because of the pandemic. We got a preliminary injunction from the district court, um, lowering the signature requirement and granting other forms of relief and also ordering the defendants to work with us on a, on a viable kind of settlement agreement. Um, but the case went up on appeal, the Sixth Circuit in, uh, stayed the injunction and then ultimately on appeal ruled against us. And um, again, it's hard to explain why uh, Ohio and the Sixth Circuit ultimately uh, decided that we weren't entitled to any relief when courts around the country were, d d you know, doing uh, along that gamut of, you know, entering a really great judgment with a lot of relief or none whatsoever. Um, it's sort of hard to explain why courts came down the way they did, but that's the range. Well, thanks for that. Um, Governor Quinn, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Hooray. Terrific. All right. Um, well, I was uh, when you when we were waiting for you to um, you know your audio to work. I had the others uh, elaborate a little bit more on their background with ballot access issues and direct democracy, and to um, mention you know what motivates them to seek solutions in this arena. So, um, would you mm -hmm. please comment on that? 
Well, I believe in direct democracy. I believe in democracy. Uh, I think it's the heart and soul of our country. It's how our country began. And unfortunately, in Illinois, we have kind of limited uh, democracy when it comes to initiatives. And uh, back uh, 1975, myself and a few of my friends looked at the Illinois Constitution, which had just been adopted in 1970, and noticed that for the first time there was a limited initiative process in the Constitution at the state level. And uh, we decided to uh, form a group called Coalition for Political Honesty, and our proposal was the Political Honesty Initiative. It was three constitutional amendments dealing with ethics in the state legislature. One of them was uh, pro prohibiting the legislators themselves from collecting their entire annual salary on the first day of office. They had this practice for many years, and uh, we found that voters didn't like the advance pay for politicians, and we got 635,158 signatures on our petition. We filed it in Springfield. Uh, the other side uh, challenged the right of our three amendments to be on the ballot and went to the Supreme Court. Uh, we lost at the Supreme Court because the Illinois Supreme Court said that ethics uh, isn't a subject for structure and procedure of the legislature. So we were disappointed by that, even though the legislature on its own passed the law to end advance pay for themselves. But we kept at it. In 1980, we did another petition drive to reduce the size of the Illinois House of Representatives. It was 177 members. They had just passed a 40% pay raise for themselves, and a lot of voters didn't like that. And they signed our petition. We got about over half a million names and put it on the ballot. It was called the Cutback Amendment. Again, the legislators try to keep it off the ballot, but this time the Illinois Supreme Court ruled in our favor in 1980. In 1982, we did another petition drive to try and broaden the definition of what you could do a statewide initiative on. It's called the Illinois Initiative. We got the signatures. It uh, was again challenged by the powers that be. Uh, the appellate court ruled that we couldn't do it. Uh, we didn't give up. In 1982 and three, we also uh, did petitions at the local level for advisory referendums on the Citizen Utility Board. They passed everywhere by wide margins. Uh, it forced the legislature to consider the issue and ultimately adopted the Citizen Utility Board law, which is still the law today and it's the largest consumer group in Illinois. 1994, we did a petition drive to put term limits on Illinois legislators, uh, both for the House and Senate. We got enough signatures, about half a million. Uh, that again was challenged by the uh, legislators led by Mike Madigan. And um, in a very narrow decision, four to three, we lost in the Supreme Court that said you couldn't do a statewide initiative on term limits for legislators. Mm -hmm. uh, later on, 2010, when I became governor, I was able to convince the legislature to put a recall amendment on the ballot for the office of governor in the aftermath of George Ryan and Rod Bogoyevich. Uh, that was on the ballot in 2010, and it passed by a two to one margin. And I'm sure you've heard from Jackson about our experience with the Evanston Voter Initiative. It was quite disappointing to see the court decision on that. Uh, although Arlington Heights has passed uh, initiative and recall in their community, and they did it by vote of the council. And I would say, given the court decision we had last year in Illinois, to get local initiative in a city, uh, it would probably have to be put on the ballot uh, by an ordinance of the council and then approved by the voters. Um, and I, and Governor Quinn, um, I thought you also pursued litigation this past year, like a corollary to what Oliver was talking about. Um, mm -hmm. he, you know, he talked about the libertarian, like third party access to the ballot. And I thought you also litigated something about the referendum. Uh, during COVID. Uh, well, that's right. Oliver is a good man indeed. I talked to him many times in the course of our lawsuit. It was called Morgan v. White. Uh, Jesse White's our Secretary of State. And what we were trying to do during the pandemic, uh, the legislature 
allowed units of local government to put referendums on the ballot by uh, resolution, online resolution. They didn't have to meet in person and they could do that remotely. Uh, they didn't permit uh, any kind of remote signature gathering uh, through electronic means by voters at the local level or at the statewide level. And uh, we then brought a federal lawsuit in the court uh, in Chicago, district court, and found the court was very hostile towards initiative process. Different than Oliver's situation, he was representing candidates for office. The Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals here in Chicago um, has had several decisions that are downright hostile towards the power of initiative, even though courts in other parts of the country have been much more friendly. Uh, we appealed our case uh, and lost, uh, but uh, basically this is something that we might want to try at the state Supreme Court level in the coming year. And voters in our state, whether they're doing a local petition drive in their city or county, or a statewide petition drive, which is allowed, should be able to gather signatures as Oliver's candidates were in 2020 uh, by electronic means. Uh, this is doable. It was shown to be very effective for the candidates in 2020, but uh, to deny people who want to put issues on the ballot as, as well as candidates, you should be able to gather signatures in an electronic way that's safe and sound and uh, would give, uh, especially now with the pandemic, people much more confidence in asking for signatures and also signing. Some people just don't want to interact on that petition passing process. Uh, um, in the state of Massachusetts, their Supreme Court ruled that you, for candidates and initiatives, can do signature gathering remotely. And um, uh, they had an executive order of the governor in New Jersey who said the same thing. And I think Oliver just mentioned that Maryland allowed for electronic signature gathering uh, for, I guess, candidates. I'm not sure about initiatives. But uh, this is a very important area for us, not just for now, but uh, for the future, that more and more people conduct their business, whether it's getting a mortgage or banking or you name it, uh, do it by digital means, electronic means. And why can't you be able to sign a petition or circulate one by electronic means the same way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, much needed reform in Illinois. Um, we should put that on the list, uh, Miriam, as one of the key reforms to try and get passed this year by the Illinois General Assembly. The candidates are, you know, obviously going to be running in the uh, primary next year, almost a year from now. Uh, they can get signatures. Uh, um, we ought to have a remote system or an electronic system for initiatives as well. Um, we have a question that I think is timely to ask right now. Um, do you think that with Speaker Madigan slipping quietly out of the door, do you think the legislature will be more amenable to to this change or to other changes in ballot access? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, Chris Welch, who's the new speaker, um, I know him well. I worked with him when I was governor and um, he's from the Western suburbs. And uh, it's ironic, two years ago, about this time I went down to his law office and I had drafted up an environmental initiative for local governments. I, invite, I also drafted a second an ethics initiative for local governments, and finally a veterans initiative for local governments. Uh, the idea that people in a municipality would be able to gather signatures on a petition for ethics or environmental health or, or helping veterans, and then put it on their local municipal ballot and let the people vote on it, yes or no. And he agreed to sponsor that. He wasn't a Speaker of the House back then, two years ago, but now he is. And I really think that's uh, an area for all of us who believe in direct democracy to work on this year, uh, at least getting the legislature by statute. They don't need a constitutional amendment mm -hmm. to allow people, if they're concerned about climate change, to have an environmental initiative in their town, or if they're sick and tired of corruption in local government in their town or anywhere, uh, put something on the ballot for tough ethics standards. Same way for helping veterans, uh, there's many, many men and women who have served our country, come home, oftentimes have problems getting jobs or health care or whatever. Uh, we ought to be able at the local level to put referendums on the ballot to help veterans. So 
I'm hope, very hopeful that Chris uh, Welch, our new speaker, will be friendly to that. Uh, the key person in the House who handles ethics and elections, that's the name of the new committee, is Kelly Burke, Representative Kelly Burke. She's been there about 10 years. And uh, again, a key person to hear some of these new ideas and hopefully uh, get them out to the whole General Assembly and pass it to law. Okay. Um, I think that I'd like uh, Jackson, if, if you will, uh, tell us a little bit about the barriers to ballot access that you studied and experienced um, before we jump into talking about the, the solutions. You know, we, we mentioned e-signature gathering as a solution to having to, you know, in COVID times, having to have that face-to-face -face contact. Um, but more generally speaking, what are barriers to both candidate nomination papers and to uh, putting referenda and initiative on the ballot? So the um, barriers that apply to both are, like the, the state of Illinois' ballot access laws are very specific as, as to uh, how the signatures need to appear on a page, um, how they need, they need to be bound since we were unable to really get the full digital signature relief that Governor Quinn was talking about. Um, in the age of COVID, you're still gonna run into a situation where you need to go bring your petition signatures in person to like in Evanston, the Civic Center, or depending on um, what race you might be running for down in Springfield. And those are, w w while we're still in a pandemic, that's not gonna be a thing that very many people are even gonna want to do, leaving aside for a moment, the fact that it just wouldn't be safe anyway, even if they did want to. Um, and that's something that I think the uh, digital signature piece of what Governor Quinn and Oliver were talking about will be very important in addressing. And the bear, I, I can speak a little bit more specifically to the barriers for ballot initiatives, because there are very, there's a very s small subset of ways where um, citizens in, in Illinois are currently allowed to put binding uh, initiatives on the ballot. Um, for statewide, there's very specific citizens can amend the legislative article of the constitution as long as those proposals are dealing with structure and procedure. Um, I, I can't recall the exact case off the top of my head, but that's narrow enough to begin with and courts have inter narrowed it even further to the point that if you're proposing something that changes the structure of the Illinois General Assembly but doesn't affect the procedure at all, you might just get kicked off the ballot for that reason alone. And um, for local initiative, it's, it's sim similar in how the Illinois courts have been narrowing that, um, uh, narrowing the ability of citizens to put things on the ballot locally. Um, in, in theory, um, a home rule municipalities like Evanston, where I live, are able to, by approval of the voters, provide for, provide for their officers. There's the officer clause, which is, um, their duties and term and manner of being elected. So an example, you can move from an appointed city clerk to an elected city clerk or change the number of village trustees. Um, I, I think the way that that section should be read is broader of changing what their duties are, but the Illinois appellate courts have not agreed. So that's something that should be there that has already been taken out. And um, and that was the basis for um, your lawsuit to to uh, validate your municipal initiative. That, that was part of the basis of the Evanston Voter Initiative, yes. Um, and um, can you speak yeah. at all about to the uh, appeals process that in Illinois? That's kind of unique. Um, local electoral boards. So the. Uh, the way that the Evanston voter, I, I can, I'll, I'll speak in form of explaining sort of what happened with the Evanston voter initiative. Um, so after, as that, after that objection that went in front of uh, the Evanston Municipal Officers Electoral Board first, where Governor Quinn very strongly made essentially the, the same arguments we were making the whole way that under the 1970 constitution, based on what the delegates who wrote that constitution were on record as saying, we think this is a correct interpretation of the power they wanted to give to citizens of 
over their local municipal governing body. Um, my personal opinion of the Evanston Electoral Board is they made their decision beforehand and found the law to justify their answer after the fact. Um, and then after the, in hindsight, very predictable results, we were able to go directly to the Cook County Circuit Court to make the argument that the uh, th that the Evanston Electoral Board was wrong, essentially. And we heard very much the same sort of arguments from the other side's attorneys who had attorneys at that time. They didn't have attorneys in front of the Evanston Electoral Board. And I thought that, that the judge who uh, oversaw our case was a little bit, this very niche part of election law seemed like a very new area. And the city of Evanston and the objectors had some very high profile attorneys who made the arguments and the judge followed followed that. Like, okay, I'll, this makes sense. We don't want uh, local power to get, local initiative power to get too strong. And then we took it up to the Illinois appellate court where we didn't get a chance at oral arguments, but the, I, I thought the opinion there was again, kind of lacking in the really in-depth analysis of addressing all our arguments and just sort of reiterated the same narrowing of, uh, of article seven. Right. And keeping the status quo. Yeah. Um, well, we did try yeah. to go to the Illinois Supreme Court too, but they elected not to take the case, right. which happens quite often. <laughs> um, Oliver, can you speak to um, any other unique barriers in Illinois' direct democracy system? Well, I'm <clears throat> much less familiar with the um, initiative process in Illinois, but I can say on the candidate side that you know, it's essentially a function of a high signature requirement, <laughs> one of the highest in the nation for independent candidates for um, for U.S. House at 5% of the previous vote, which sounds reasonable as a percentage, but um, um, in translation, it, it turns out to be over 10,000 signatures for a single uh, U.S. Uh, single candidate for Congress. Um, and they have to get those signatures in only 90 days. Um, and to get you know, 10,000 or more valid signatures, you have to collect about 15,000 in total because so many are invalidated. And I think actually in Illinois, it's, it's even more than that. Um, you know, to be really safe, you probably want to double the signature requirement. And this goes back to um, the importance of electronic petitioning, as Governor Quinn mentioned. It's, I mean, think about it. You're having to get 10 or 20,000 valid signatures for statewide office, it's 25,000. That means 50,000 total. Just think of the amount of paperwork involved. Think of the sheer administrative burden of collecting that many signatures by hand on paper nomination petitions. But um, elect so electronic petitioning would obviously facilitate the process, make it much less burdensome, much less expensive, just by eliminating all the paperwork. Um, but another key aspect of electronic petitioning, and this of course would apply on the initiative side as well, is that in the limited jurisdictions, Arizona does this, the District of Columbia actually does it, uh, and the city of Denver has, has, a, has a, an electronic procedure as well. And then, of course, as Governor Quinn mentioned, many states were able to do it on the fly. In 2020, a pandemic hits and suddenly um, they allow electronic petitioning almost with no advance notice and there were no problems with it. But again, um, one of the key benefits here is that these, these procedures can be integrated with the voter rolls so that when you're collecting a signature, um, they can be validated automatically, and that will eliminate the need to collect 50 or 100 percent more than the actual signature requirement. So this is a huge and long overdue reform um, that really should have should have been implemented a long time ago. We we do everything else these days online. Um, you can request ballots online. You can. Um, you know, and of course you can sign your check or your, your, your tab at a restaurant. Um, you can um, take out a mortgage. You can um, transact any number of business transactions electronically. And yet 
Uh, Illinois and pretty much every other state is still requiring candidates and voters and initiative proponents who are trying to access the ballot um, uh, to, to, to do it the way they had to do it over 100 years ago when these laws were first enacted. It's, it's neglect for sure, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, what has uh, happened is that in many states, and I think Illinois probably qualifies as one, um, there's a cottage industry of lawyers who use the uh, minutia and the technicalities uh, involved in collecting 10 or 20 or 50,000 signatures by hand and, and, and invalidating you know, otherwise qualified voters' valid signatures, but they didn't dot their I's, they didn't cross their T's, they didn't do it exactly the way the statute says you have to do it. And so that voter's vote, that voter's signature is invalidated um, and, and it's just, it's becoming a pretense um, more than anything else. They're using these antiquated procedures to enable um, generally incumbents to eliminate their competition and to prevent new parties and new candidates from, from gaining traction from actually getting on the ballot. Thank you. Um, Governor Quinn, do you have anything to add about the barriers to the ballot in Illinois? Well, I t totally agree with Oliver's statement there. There is this cottage industry of lawyers who specialize in keeping issues and people off the ballot, and they try to use every trick in the book, and it really is harmful to democracy. I will want to, maybe if I could, uh, Miriam, mention a few things you can do that we've had to litigate sometimes and use our elbows to win, but uh, there are some current subjects you can do initiatives on, at least at the local level in Illinois. You can put term limits on your municipal or county officials. Uh, that can be done by initiative and referendum. Uh, you can, I believe, do recall for county and municipal elected officials. I did a case in 1981, it's called Williamson v. Doyle, where the appellate court said you can't use initiative to set up recall in a town or municipality. But then uh, the appellate court in 2016 overruled that decision and said that uh, recall can be done through uh, a process of direct democracy. It requires a referendum of the voters. Uh, so those are two things that are probably good subjects uh, to try. Oak Forest uh, created a taxpayer advocate about 20 years ago, I think it was 1998, by initiative and referendum in their town. And that office still exists. They created a new office of taxpayer advocate. And the town of Moni is trying to do that again by referendum this year. Uh, you could do, try a taxpayer advocate or a consumer advocate in your town or county. Uh, another one uh, is uh, an elected uh, ethics board uh, that was put on the ballot in Niles. They had an appointed ethics board of their town. The previous mayor had been sent to jail for corruption. So they had an ethics board. It was appointed by the mayor. And the uh, petition passer, Joe McCullough, went out there and gathered signatures, put a referendum on the ballot for an elected ethics board. And uh, that's going to be voted on this year. Uh, I think probably the subject of redistricting could be uh, initiated under the current rules. And finally, uh, as mentioned by Jackson, you can move an appointed office to an elected office by petition and referendum. And one thing that's interesting is in the Midwest, Milwaukee, St. Louis, and California, all the big cities have an elected corporation council in their municipalities. They don't have it appointed by the mayor or the village manager. It's elected by the people. And these corporation councils and the lawyer of the town are oftentimes very powerful. And many times the voters want a chance to uh, decide that who they want in that office, not just the insiders. Okay. Um, can any of you speak to uh, equity issues with reaching the ballot? Like are, do different demographics have um, different success rates? Um, I, I don't want to monopolize the conversation here, but I was involved in a petition drive in Chicago in uh, 2018 
uh, to have term limits for the mayor of Chicago. Of the 10 largest cities in our country, nine out of 10 have term limits on the mayor. Guess what? Chicago is the only one that doesn't. But uh, as I said a moment ago, you can petition term limits onto the ballot. That's been upheld uh, by the Illinois Supreme Court. And 25 cities in Illinois have done this, uh, term limits on their local officials. So we were out there getting signatures. Uh, I can tell you Rahm Emanuel was a very unpopular guy, particularly with uh, African-Americans. And uh, we went to places like Millennium Park and all kinds of parks uh, getting signatures. And uh, there was very enthusiastic signing and circulating of the petition by uh, African-American uh, voters. Um, and what did Rahm Emanuel do? Here's another thing we got to change. He got the city council about a month before we filed our petition. He got the Chicago city council to put three advisory questions on the 2018 ballot. Uh, and then he uh, went to court and said, oh, no, the uh, term limits can't be on the ballot. Uh, we have a rule of three in Illinois that only three questions can be on any municipal or county ballot at any one time. And we've already used that up. We passed that three three uh, weeks ago or something. And the court uh, let them get away with it. So that's another thing besides getting uh, digital petition passing, electronic petition passing. We really got to protect uh, initiative uh, by the voters from this rule of three that's used by insiders to keep questions off the ballot. And uh, it's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, definitely. So, so let's turn more to solutions. We talked a lot about e-signature um, collecting and how you know that would ameliorate the um, the uh, the level of uh, the number of appeals that are um, kick, that kick candidates and referenda off the ballot um, by virtue of you know saving these signatures. These signatures are uh, likely to be discovered as valid or invalid immediately upon the e-signature. And so um, it really saves a lot of time and trouble. Um, what other um, uh, solutions do you think should be enacted in Illinois to ballot access? Um, do you wanna start? I, I know Oliver earlier mentioned um, sig signatures, the number of signatures can you, Oliver, with your experience with uh, looking at other states, like what do you think is a an, a reasonable number of signatures, say, for to collect to um, say run as a as a candidate for the House? I have a colleague named Richard Winger, who's editor of Ballot Access News. He's sort of the nation or the world, for that matter, the world's leading expert in, in ballot access laws. And he has done the empirical analysis to demonstrate that any state that has had a signature requirement um, greater than 5,000 um, has never had more than eight candidates on the ballot for statewide office. So 5,000 signatures seems to be a pretty good baseline. You know, maybe in a state like Texas, um, they should have a, a slightly higher signature requirement in Cal California, New York. The, the larger states, but Texas currently requires more than 80,000 signatures um, and uh, for, for statewide office. And California requires for an um, independent candidate um, for statewide office um, close to 200, or I think it's going to be over 200,000 signatures in 2021. There's just, I mean, these numbers are off the charts. It doesn't matter at some point how big the state is. The question is, um, what is the state's purpose? Mm -hmm. And it can't be, well, we're allowed to require more signatures because we're a bigger state. No, the, the answer has to be, what is the state's interest here? Does the state have some reason for requiring X number of signatures? And just as a general principle, um, the rule ought to be that the signature requirement should be as low as it can be um, while still protecting the state's legitimate interests in regulating the ballot to candidates that have some modicum, that's the term courts use, means a small amount, modicum of public support. Um, and, and anything more than that really um, should be struck down as, as unconstitutional. 
uh, unconstitutional infringement on citizens' right to vote and associational rights and equal protection rights. Um, and unfortunately, in many cases, courts are not doing that unless we are able to demonstrate that the law is so off the charts unconstitutional that it's just impossible for anybody to comply with. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's in, in, in most states, signature requirements are way more restrictive than they need to be. Um, Governor Quinn, can you uh, speak to the number of signatures that are required to put referenda on the ballot? Um, do you find those to be reasonable or do you think that there's room for change? Well, when I was governor, I was able to get uh, local signature requirements uh, reduced um, and um, pretty much the standard now is whatever the jurisdiction, uh, the number is going to be 8% of the total number of people who voted for governor in that jurisdiction in the last election. So if you're in a city, it's how many people in your city voted for the office of governor, and then you take 8% of that. And um, I don't think that is likely to get uh, reduced. It should be, however, reduced for candidates, as Oliver was just mentioning, in Cook County to run for like assessor, you need to have 8,000 or 10,000 names, or the same way with the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. I don't think there should be any signature requirement for uh, office, for any public office in Illinois, uh, higher than 5,000, because that's the number you need to file for governor and all the statewide offices. So for candidates, the signature requirement should be never higher than 5,000, no matter what the jurisdiction. For referendums, in addition to uh, getting rid of this rule of three, if you're going to have any rule, you should say, well, the rule of three for the council for putting three referendums on the ballot, but then there should also be room for three citizen initiatives on the ballot. That would be a reasonable reform. Uh, we should try and get that this year. Again, uh, Kelly Burke is the chairperson of the Elections and Ethics Committee in the House, and she needs to hear from folks about that. Uh, another uh, one is, do we really need to have notarization of petitions? Illinois is one of the very few states that requires candidate and initiative petitions to not, to not only be affirmed by the circulator, you sign that when you sign the bottom form, but you got to have it notarized. Well, very few states do that anymore. It's not necessary once you take an affirmation. And that's another way that the insiders use to try and keep people off the ballot. Um, one issue that might be looked at by folks uh, outside of uh, Chicago, uh, Chicagoans can put advisory questions on their precinct ballot or on a group of precincts or on their ward ballot if they wish. Uh, they're all advisory questions, but it's uh, been used quite a bit. But you can't do that outside of Chicago. Uh, whether it's Cook County or DuPage or any other county. And I remember talking to Mike Madigan one time about trying to get these precinct referendum rights uh, for all voters in Illinois. Uh, a lot of times people have ideas for reform. It might be in their precinct or perhaps their group of precincts, their neighborhood. And so they should be able to put some question on the ballot for that. So I think those are ideas worth uh, exploring. Uh, as I think about it, there's one more thing <clears throat> that any of the listeners might be interested in. In Chicago, any uh, citizen or any voter can uh, bring an ordinance to the city council, the city clerk, and the city clerk is required by law, city ordinance, to submit that to the city council at its next meeting. Uh, I would like to see that uh, broadened statewide. Uh, <clears throat> if voters uh, have an idea for an ordinance and they give it to the city or village clerk, then that ought to be submitted to the council at its next meeting. And what I'd put on to that is requiring the council after 60 days or whatever to actually take a vote on that citizen ordinance. Yes or no, they may not vote for it, but at least give uh, more democracy to everyday people coming up with ideas to make their city or their community better. 
You know, you mentioned Kelly Burke and Chris Welch in the house. And one of the questions that came through is who would be receptive in the Senate? Well, a couple of people, I think. Um, definitely Don Harmon, the president of the Senate. He happens to be my senator. I live in the west side of Chicago, and he represents Oak Park and, and Chicago. So Don Harmon's a key man. I think he's going to be more open to these ideas, uh, especially coming, he lives in Oak Park, which believes in democracy. And so I, I think Don should definitely be visited. Um, I don't know the chair people of all of his committees. Uh, we'll have to look that up. But it was very interesting today, two Republican senators, um, one is Jason Barrickman from Blo Bloomington area. Another one is the Senate Minority Leader, he's brand new, uh, Dan uh, McCullough or something like that. I'm not sure about his name. But they proposed today a uh, constitutional amendment that would allow voters in Illinois, by initiative, to propose constitutional amendments uh, by initiative and referendum uh, without restrictions. Uh, so the uh, structure and procedure of the legislature rule would be uh, abolished. And if we wanted to do an initiative on environment or ethics reform or uh, uh, independent maps, you name it, for uh, redistricting, you could initiate that by petition as a constitutional amendment. This is what they have, by the way, in Michigan and Ohio and Missouri and about 23 or four other states. Uh, so we would get that in Illinois, full-fledged initiative. And that would be definitely something to pursue this year. Um, we have another question um, uh, specific to the California context where through referenda, rights that had been granted were taken away through referendum. So it, um, the, the questioner says, in 2008, a majority of California voters excluded same-sex couples from marriage rights. In 2020, a majority of Colorado voters eradicated their state's suffrage at 17 law by referendum. How can the power of voters be expanded without putting the minority rights at the mercy of the majority? Oliver, do you have any well, questions? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, in many ways, I mean, that's sort of the age-old question of, of, of democratic societies, right? You, you have a majoritarian rule and what happens when the majority wants to oppress a minority. Um, as a constitutional lawyer, one of um, the best answers I know of is the First and the Fourteenth Amendment and um, the, the Bill of Rights. Um, it's an imperfect remedy, of course, because it requires uh, usually years of litigation and uneven in outcomes in federal or state courts. But um, that is essentially the, I think, the, the strongest safeguard we have for the rights of minorities. Um, and we know that even with those safeguards, it often takes years of struggle uh, and perhaps bad court decisions that are ultimately overturned by good court decisions. But um, um, it, it's, it's an ongoing struggle and, and it requires both um, work on the legal side and of course it requires brave people uh, organizing and, and being vocal and active politically um, and, and in their daily lives to try to ensure that minority rights are protected uh, from, from that sort of infringement. Governor Quinn, did you have something to say about that? Yeah. Well, I agree that uh, no state constitutional referendum can overturn the first or 14th amendments of our federal constitution, as Oliver just said. For that matter, they can't overturn uh, the uh, same rights that we have in our state of Illinois constitution regarding due process, equal protection, and so on. But I think one way to look at this is initiatives, perhaps in the past, have been used for measures that were struck down by a federal court. But a lot of times, if you look at recent years in particular, the voters in Florida passed a constitutional amendment uh, to allow voting for ex-felons, people who used who were returning citizens, uh, they got their voting rights thanks to a 
a voter initiative that was put on the ballot for a constitutional amendment. Florida, matter of fact, just recently, this past election, voted for a $15 minimum wage and put it in their constitution. Um, in the past, if you look at it, uh, uh, Illinois, uh, the way women received the vote, right to vote in Illinois before 1920, that was done by uh, petition passing for advisory referendums and ultimately was passed into law. So initiatives can be used to expand rights, not restrict rights. And it, it is, it's not perfect. Nobody can say every initiative is the best thing since Swiss cheese. Uh, sometimes there's some bum questions. You vote no. Uh, more often than not, people do vote no. But uh, if we're going to ever get ethics reform in Illinois, uh, don't count on the legislature or the powers that be to reform themselves. Uh, we have more corrupt politicians in our state than just about anywhere, and they just aren't going to pass tough ethics standards unless we do have a strong initiative process that uh, does what they just did in Missouri a couple of years ago, clean Missouri of comprehensive ethics measure that... Uh, uh, the voters passed, even though the politicians in office were not happy about it. So it seems to me that we got to have a safety valve of direct democracy, uh, especially on things like ethics and environmental protection and making sure working people get a fair shake. Um, Jackson and Oliver, can you either of you point to like a model state? that you think has a really good system for initiative and referendum or for candidate um, access? Jackson, do you want to go first? I was, I was going to say, if Oliver, Oliver wants to take that first, um, mm -hmm. I, I don't. I, I, I think that a lot of the neighboring states that Governor Quinn previously mentioned are doing the initiative, uh, the initiative process better than Illinois is. Um, having that right built into the constitution for um, both constitutional amendments and um, I can't remember if it's Idaho, but there are, uh, I will go see if I can find that. But there yes, are it, it, Idaho that you used in the, uh, in the research was a great example. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, Idaho is another example of a right to initiative that is more firmly, uh, firmly protected in a way that I think Illinois can learn a lot from. Um, if Oliver wants to take the candidate side, I can see if I can find more specifics to say. Oliver? Sure. I, um, it, well, for example, Pennsylvania, now that we won that lawsuit, has some pretty reasonable requirements, um, but they were established by court order. Uh, and if and when the legislature enacts remedial legislation, I have a feeling the signature requirement won't be as low as 5,000, which is what it is now based on the evidence we submitted in that case. Um, you know, different states are, are, have different requirements for different offices and depending on if it's a, a minor party or an independent candidate, um, um, there are some states that are kind of notoriously bad. Texas, I mentioned, is one of them. Um, but um, uh, on, uh, I, I focus much less on the states where it's easy because um, there aren't any problems there. I think Tennessee has a pretty low requirement for um, parties to qualify. Um, but essentially it's, it's a function, as I mentioned, of a signature requirement and the time limit for collecting them and the absence of all these other um, sort of ancillary requirements that can really increase the burden like notarization requirements, um, you know, geographical dis distribution requirements. I mean, um, to the extent that the law is simple enough for any candidate or party to understand relatively easily, um, and the signature requirement is reasonable, and there's a reasonable amount of time uh, allowed to do it, and not too many other um, burdensome restrictions um, you know, that, that's, I think, what qualifies as a good law. And to the extent that the signature requirements go far up and up beyond what the state interests require and the state um, limits the time uh, allowed to do it, then um, it becomes a, a much more difficult law to comply with. But again, there's such a variation in, in, in the various state laws. And even within one state, it may be, you know, next to impossible 
um, to form a new political party, but uh, ballot access as an independent is relatively um, reasonable. And so uh, everybody just runs as an independent rather than trying to get on with the party label. So there are all those kinds of idiosyncrasies and it, it makes it sort of hard to generalize. I have a good follow-up question here um, about the local process here in Illinois and some of the issues with it. In Blue Island, local political boss uh, consistently challenges all opponents' petitions without cause. Well, you know, or with narrow cause, as we, as we discussed. Um, his allies usually serve on the electoral board and decide his way. So we have these really local electoral boards here, as we know. What can citizens do about uh, this potential abuse of power? And uh, this questioner points out that when the circuit coin court appointed electoral boards uh, this winter results were, were very different than when they have that local electoral board, which is usually the head of the public body, the clerk and the longest serving member um, who obviously have a lot of political connections. Well, I think uh, the uh, questioner uh, identifies a very serious problem in Illinois. The mayor and perhaps the mayor's fr friend, the clerk, um, that constitute the majority of the local electoral board, three people, and then the longest serving uh, alderman or council member, they uh, can oversee challenges to initiatives or to candidates. And only if they themselves are involved in the election are they taken off the board and another agency is appointed. In general, a lot of these electoral, local electoral boards are biased. I certainly we're in Evanston where the Evanston voter initiative was heard. So uh, that's uh, definitely a reform. I don't think uh, many other states have that kind of uh, unfair system set up. Um, I mentioned earlier this rule of three, uh, one way or to reform that in Illinois, Illinois is the only state with a rule of three limit on referendums that can be put on the ballot by the voters. Uh, if the council wants to put three questions on, they, they should be in one channel and the voters should always have the right to do three if they wish and uh, uh, that has been used over and over again the rule of three in Illinois by incumbent councils to keep voter initiatives off the ballot um, you know another interesting one as far as model states is Massachusetts you can go out and get signatures for a statewide referendum and uh, first, it has to be voted on by the General Assembly. They have a chance there, the incumbent legislators, to vote on your idea before it even goes on the ballot. It's sort of like an opportunity to get uh, the legislature to get moving. And if they don't vote for it or they don't address it, then voters have to go out and get a certain number of more signatures to get their question on the ballot. And this past election, that's what happened in Massachusetts. They were able to get electronic petition passing, and they were able, after the legislature there didn't address certain subjects, uh, after they were petitioned to do so, uh, then the voters put it on the ballot and voter, uh, people at large voted on it. So Oliver mentioned uh, the notarization requirement for petitions. I think uh, most states don't have that. So Illinois has some features that are really designed to stymie especially initiative passing of petitions, but also candidate petitions, and just not right. Does Illinois allow um, private citizens to challenge p initiative petitions once they're filed just the way, yeah. So um, Illinois is one of the few states that allows private citizens to, to bring what is essentially a lawsuit against a candidate or an initiative proponent to invalidate the petitions they, they submit. And uh, as I mentioned, in, in many cases, this just becomes a kind of a cottage industry of uh, incumbents um, reducing voter choice by eliminating competition based on legal technicalities. Um, and it's not clear that, that, that you know, there's any legitimate reason for this to be a feature of Illinois law. Pennsylvania also um, allows private citizens to file these kinds of challenges. But in most states, you file your petitions with the Secretary of State or the, uh, the elections authority in, in the relevant jurisdiction. They validate the, the signatures on the petition. 
And um, then you're either on the ballot or you're off the ballot. And if you think the decision was wrong, you can appeal it and then ultimately take it to court um, if, if, you, if, if you don't prevail in an administrative um, uh, appeal. But the idea that um, you know, anybody has a constitutional right to go out and try to force a candidate or an initiative off the ballot and deny voters the opportunity to express their preference on the candidate or the initiative, I think is, is just wrong. There's, there's no valid reason that that should be a, a feature of the law. I think you make a good point. Uh, basically, the challengers of uh, candidate petitions or initiative petitions almost always are incumbents, people who are in the process already. Uh, when we did the cutback amendment to reduce the size of the legislature, you know, it was legislators who wanted to keep it off the ballot. They went to the extreme lengths of passing the law during the petition rise making it harder to pass petitions. It was almost like you had to uh, be the same blood type as the person uh, si circulating the petition before you could sign it. And uh, we had to go to both state court, the Supreme Court, and then the federal court to strike down some of the very onerous restrictions that were put on petition passing. And um, it is unfortunate. There are people who get in office and they think they're entitled to it, they should uh, be happy with a, a process where people can put ideas on the ballot issues uh, at the local ballot or at statewide ballot. It's going to be a fight this coming 20, 2021, 2022 to broaden the initiative power, to have more direct democracy in Illinois. Now, I am optimistic because we have some new leaders there at Springfield, and then we have all these municipal elections coming up in uh, April of this year. And we need to get our mayors, our city council members, uh, opening their eyes to the potential of having people in their town being able to put questions on the ballot or bring things before the council. And uh, all of us have to roll up our sleeves and use our citizen muscles to get more direct democracy statewide as well as local. Um, we have another question from uh, a woman who grew up in California with binding referendums, and she's concerned that it attracted certain fringe ideas and groups, as well as good ones. So how do we keep these ideas, the fringe ideas from becoming law, especially with so many people supporting, um, you know, conspiracy ideas, um, like in this past election? So how do you keep referendums from becoming mob rule? If I may, I think this relates back to that other other yeah. question, which was um, from a true friend of the program, Andy Kaneen, who was my high school government teacher. So thank yeah. you for joining us. Um, I, I want to just kind of frame it as, are there any limiting factors you can put to protect um, the rights of the minority from the majority? Um, um, anything besides, you know, our first and 14th amendment or various state constitutional provisions, are there limiting factors that you can put in that won't so tie the hands of uh, citizens looking to do a referendum, but will protect the minority? Well, just answering the whole idea of fringe ideas, fringe groups, uh, they have to pass the referendum uh, by majority vote. And uh, in our state, and I think most states, uh, passing a referendum is very hard, uh, even if it's a great idea. Uh, you have to roll up your sleeves and uh, knock on doors and uh, win the day. And so uh, goofy ideas on the ballot, uh, if they get enough signatures, that's question one. And the signature requirement's pretty high. It's not small. And if you do that, then you know, if the idea is voted by the voters, more often than that, it'll be voted down. But having said that, uh, regarding the government teachers' uh, ideas, Another way of going at initiative, in our state at least, is to pick certain subjects that are very important. Uh, I would say ethics, that's in the Constitution, high ethical standards for uh, officials. Uh, is that being lived up, lived up to? No. Uh, but, you know, that's in the Constitution, ethical standards. Another one is we have an environmental article in Illinois that says everyone has a right to a healthful environment. And it's the duty of every person to provide and maintain a healthful environment. For this, 
and future generations. Well, if you'd said ethics, environment, uh, affordable housing, kind of basic subjects that you could initiate a question on, that would at least be progress in our state. Because right now, the courts under the current constitution and under current laws have been very difficult and hostile towards petition passing and initiative. So if uh, the legislature of Illinois, it would have to pass a constitutional amendment to allow for any changes in statewide uh, referendums, but the legislature could pass a law, a statute with 50% uh, majority uh, for broadening the initiative power at the local level, at the city and county level. And so uh, I would hope that folks listening today, um, we, we, we got to use anything we can to broaden the democracy power. Uh, if we can get a, an ethics initiative uh, passed in Illinois for every city and town in our state, uh, that voters in Evanston or Chicago or you name it can put something on the ballot dealing with ethical standards to the local officials, that would be a great progress. And ideally, it would be best to get a statewide constitutional amendment that will allow for state and local initiative petition passing, as they have in Ohio, Michigan, and Missouri. And they've had that here in the Midwest for the last 100 years. All those states seem to uh, be doing okay. They've all used this power recently for good per causes. And uh, we're in Illinois. we got to catch up. If I could add something briefly to that. Um, I think the uh, going at specific important areas is a very valid part of that. As an example, the proposed uh, constitutional amendment that Governor Quinn talked about earlier that would create a more broad statewide initiative power it does have language in the proposal um, saying that the initiative process shall not be used for proposal modification or repeal of any portion of the bill of rights a bill of rights of this constitution so there are um there are clauses like that that could be put into any future proposal for initiative at, at, at either state or local or uh, local level going forward that identify specifically important areas that we don't want just don't want to necessarily be touched and sectioning those off and then allowing the democratic process to go forward strongly with the rest of it. Thanks for that, Jackson. Um, ben, are there any other questions? Yes, there are. Um, I think that uh, Governor Quinn's comment really leads into this one well. Um, are there any coalitions currently working on reforms for the 102nd General Assembly? Or maybe if you could share um, uh, maybe Jackson or Governor Quinn, you've heard of just some some champions beyond those legislators, um, groups that are working on these issues that um, people might want to get involved with. And we, of course, have uh, worked with a, a number of groups and our coalition partners on this as well, and we'll be uh, monitoring the situation. But if, uh, if either of you have uh, any other information about coalitions or organizations working on this, um, we'd love to share that. Well, if I can... Um... Number one, salute Citizen Advocacy Center and Ben and Miriam and your great founder, uh, Teresa Amato. Uh, this is a real good subject for Citizen Advocacy Center members and supporters to work on in the coming two years. Uh, we ought to put stuff on the ballot in this in 2022 that really gives people a chance to vote on issues and broaden the initiative power. Um, having said that, um, you know, I think if we go back in history, believe it or not, back to the turn of the last century, in 1902, uh, Illinois voted uh, in that election in 1910, and then later, I think, in 1918, three times in statewide referendums on whether or not we should have statewide initiative and local initiative. The voters voted in advisory questions three times. And they voted yes overwhelmingly every single time. And I'm sure that would happen again now, uh, 122 years later. Uh, so we should take a lesson from the past. It was a group called, I think, the Illinois Referendum League or something of that nature that promoted this. And believe it or not, in 1912, Edward Dunn was elected governor of Illinois. And his number one issue on his platform 
was getting initiative for the state of Illinois, like they had in many other states around the country at that time, was the progressive movement. And Dunn got himself elected. He passed uh, out of the Senate a constitutional amendment for initiative. It went to the House in 1913. It was voted on, and it looked like it had enough votes until the very last minute a guy from Cook County who had voted yes raised his hand and switched his vote to no. And that meant they didn't have enough votes for the initiative process for our state to go on the ballot. And so we just got to catch up. It's only 108 years later, a um, century later. It should have happened back then. Now we got to do it in the coming year. Here we've got a gubernatorial election next year. Let's get everybody who's run for office uh, to take a, a good n- new look at the power of direct democracy and initiative. It'll make Governor Dunn real happy. Even though he's passed on, I'm sure he will be very proud of what we're doing today. All right, thanks for that history lesson. Gotta gotta research that. That sounds really interesting. Um, Any other questions, Ben? There's one here, um, it's a great point uh, that the California referendums often end up being about the the money involved Mm -hmm. and that the the side, the, the, side with more resources is often able to sort of um, um, flood the uh, market and uh, win, win that way. So um, there's a question about whether this can be tied in any way, um, referendums to campaign finance reform. Um, if any of you want to answer that, maybe maybe uh, Oliver or Governor Quinn, um, I know there'd be a lot of First Amendment issues there, so. Oliver? Is the- is the question um, once the referendum or what, once the initiative is on the ballot, uh, which side has most money is, is the one that prevails or is it a question about getting it on the ballot? The point was that in California, it often ends up being the side uh, with the, the money that, that um, wins once it is on the ballot. Um, but the question was, could there be any limiting factor, you know, campaign finance reform efforts there? Um, you know, in terms of limiting money in the referendum process once it's on the ballot. I thought Buckley v. Vallejo said you couldn't limit. Yeah, I think you'd have um, a lot of trouble yeah. with uh, referendum questions, Funding especially. Yeah, referendums. Well, right. Yeah, keep and, in mind. Uh, go ahead, Oliver. I'm sorry, I, Governor Quinn. I was just going to say, um, I know that uh, Citizens United has radically changed the campaign finance landscape. But I don't think anybody interested in these issues should take this as a as a as a resolved question because um, uh, corporations are not people, contrary to what uh, Mitt Romney said when he was running uh, for president. They're not, and to the extent that corporations have some legitimate interest in influencing uh, the electoral process, they are already and were able before Citizens United to form PACs political action committees. That is a distinct legal entity that the corporation forms and is regulated uh, as a political entity um, uh, that is intended to influence the electoral process. And of course, uh, contributions to that entity are are limited under federal law. Um, This idea that a corporation can simply take its shareholders, uh, its stockholders, funds and and use them to influence an election because the corporation itself has some legitimate interest in doing so, I think is wrong. And um, it was supposedly solving a a problem that didn't exist. And that is that the corporation already did have a way of influencing the electoral process, but it had to do so by forming a political action committee. So uh, to the extent that the the concern is that big money would dictate outcomes, uh, I, I'm not um, denigrating that concern. I, I think that's you know very obviously the case, not only with initiatives, but also with uh, 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 candidate elections. Uh, it's almost always the case that the candidate who spends the most money wins the election. Um, and, and these are legitimate concerns, but I think that um, there's a big difference between citizens uh, joining together um, to support candidates or initiatives 
um, using small contributions um, than, than, than corporations doing it um, uh, or powerful industries doing it. And so I think there are ways to regulate the process that protect the rights of average citizens um, or, or all citizens equally, I should say, um, while limiting the influence that, that corporations and powerful uh, in, in industry has on the process. We have only five think, more minutes and I wanna make sure we're mm -hmm. on time. Are there any final thoughts that each of you would like to share? Well, just following up on what uh, Oliver just said, you know, initiatives have been used to get uh, pass campaign finance reform. Uh, uh, for example, Arizona has a public finance system. I believe Maine does. I think those were both done by initiative. Uh, Clean Missouri, which was a campaign uh, finance reform measure in part, uh, was passed by initiative just in 20, 2018, I think it was. Uh, Seattle has a very interesting system called Democracy Dollars, where everyone, every voter gets, uh, I think, 100 bucks. Uh, to decide who they want to support, every voter. Uh, so creative ideas, uh, whether it's on campaign finance or, for example, minimum wage, the whole minimum wage raising it movement began in a uh, suburb of Seattle, $15 minimum wage through a referendum, an, initi an initiative that was put on the ballot, and it spread across the country in the last decade. So uh, oftentimes creative ideas uh, come about through initiatives uh, of all places, uh, places like Idaho and, and uh, Oklahoma, the voters uh, passed uh, expansion of health care where their governor and legislature didn't want to do it. The people decided uh, more people needed health insurance and voted for a referendum to do that. So I think uh, we shouldn't undersell the ability of voters in Illinois to get reforms that too often are not done uh, because of powerful interests or just legislative inertia. Amen. If, if I could very briefly use my last thoughts to go back to a question that Ben asked. I'm sure there are more statewide oil groups active working on these issues that I need to get in touch with, but <laughs> where the activism, the strongest activism that I've seen, like this really comes local. Like you'll have a local activist who wants to make some meaningful change in the structure of the village government and starts putting together a petition to make that happen, finding people both in that municipality that want to do that and other municipalities that have done it before. In Evanston, we had the Evanston Voter Initiative folks who are still organizing and still working this time for the 2021 elections. It's the Evanston Alliance for Better Gov uh, Evanston Alliance for Better Government, I think is what it's called. I'm, I'm totally getting the name wrong, but these people are doing great things and that's where it starts. And I wish I knew more examples from other municipalities to tell people about, but if you're able to reach out to any of those people or anyone else and just put a group together, that's gonna lead to a lot of great things. And we'll certainly keep sharing uh, as we hear more and um, even if there's anything in this uh, legislative session. Well, it's- well, now's, oh. yeah, now's the time, Miriam. Uh, yeah. This is, I think, the best opportunity we've had in a long time with new leadership in the House and Don Harmon's just coming back for the second time in the Senate and in, in the governor uh, up for election next year. Now's the time to bring these ideas uh, and subjects and bills for direct democracy to their attention. Uh, you know, Chris Welch actually sponsored three of the ideas of ethics initiative, environmental initiative, veterans initiative. So let's get them going. And uh, Citizen Advocacy Center is a good place for people to get a hold of and get involved in this uh, great movement. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think the time is ripe. I think we've got the, the leadership now um, that will entertain these great ideas. So I'm excited about that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. thank, thank you all of you for joining us tonight. Thanks to the panelists, Jackson, Oliver, and Governor Quinn. Thank you so much for sharing your thank expertise you. and your experience. Um, I know we just scratched the surface of all these topics and um, you know they can be really complicated. If anyone out there has more questions about this, you can call Ben or me. 
um, at CAC or email us and we will try our best to answer your questions. So again, thank you all of you for joining us. And you can find our contact info at our website, which I just dropped into the uh, chat at citizenadvocacycenter.org. And um, please, if you enjoyed the program and want to see more, uh, consider donating while you're on the webpage. So thank you all and have a great rest of your evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Bye now.